on the last edition of Home Games, which you can find on YouTube. Actually, you can find it by just following the same spot that you found this one. We talked about rules and sports that we would change if we had that kind of power. And we heard from you. We heard from lots of you. Icing on power plays. Why do we allow that one? Fair catch in football. Two serves in tennis, which is a really good, interesting idea. Why do they get two serves in tennis? Anyway, we had more. So today, part two of stupid rules in sports that we would change if we had the power. And what are they? Let's go down that rabbit hole. Let's go, yeah. Bob. Rule number five that you would change if you had control of the sports universe. Oh, boy. I got a couple of here, but I'll lean towards this in the National Hockey League. And again, it goes in line with points for, uh, points for losing in overtime again. And I'm going right back to failure, uh, rewarding failure. If you win, you win. You lose, you lose. Isn't that why we play sports? And I know back in the day and in some sports, we still have ties. But if you're going to not have a tie and you, and you think that the tie is not a great way to resolve the game, I'm fine. If you want to have overtime, have overtime. If you're controversial about three-on-three three or four-on-four, four, uh, that argument, argument will go on forever. I like three-on-three. Three. I think it's actually kind of exciting. And if you want to have the silly shootout, the skills game, so be it. But if you lose, you lose. There are no points. And what I think it does to its core and why it really, really bothers me, and you hear Gary Bettman, who we all agree is a very, very smart, smart man, he goes on and on about the competitive nature in terms of the points for the National Hockey League. I believe that's, in, that's, that's kind of made up because of this point for losing rule. I believe it's somewhat artificial, and I, don't, I think it's better to have the good teams and the not-so-good teams. See? But because of the ruling, it, everything gets clumped together. So, you know, during this time of the year when there's a 10 games left, oh, look how close the races are. Anyway, I'm going on and on, but it bothers awesome. me. Steve, what do you think? I, I, you know, there, there's, there's validity in that. I will say that uh, it's become an American game, and it has for many, many years, and the Americans don't like ties. So that's the root of this uh, uh, argument in the first place. Uh, ties have been a big part of hockey for a long, long time, but I'd, I'd be willing to let that go. What I would do uh, is not take away the single point in the overtime. The first thing, I get rid of the shootout by reducing it from three to two. That's closer to, to – that's what they do in minor hockey, right? I mean, in a tournament, right, to get it done, and it's over in a hurry, and it's really more exciting than a shootout. Uh, but, but the other thing I would do is make it three points for a win in regulation time then all the games are worth the same. The problem is that as you get later in the season, those games aren't worth the same sometimes as, as other games. Some games are three. There's three points available. Some point games, there's only two. So make three points available every single game. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Uh, you know, this uh, parity in the NHL and, and really any other league that, that uh, uh, supports losing is that it's, it's artificially – uh, inseminated, if you will. You know, this parody, uh, uh, rewarding teams for losing in overtime, they get a point. Um, and, and at the end of the season, wow, yeah, as Bubba said, you know, all these teams are so jam-packed together is because these teams have, you know, 12 overtime losses or, or 12 shootout losses, 12 extra time losses, and they're rewarded for losing that game just by one goal after regulation. It doesn't make any sense to me. I like the two points for a win, zero for a loss. You don't mess with the, he the history books that way in terms of most points in a season because now you're going to have to add asterisks and the like. Uh, the winner gets the points, the loser gets nothing. And, uh, you know, if you want parity, then the team should improve their rosters. Gary Bettman will be thrilled to know that he's been artificially inseminated. <laughs> uh, uh, I will say to, to Steve's point about the, another option rather than the shootout, when I coached minor hockey, we played in a tournament at least once where you started five on five for the first minute, four on four, three on three. That game finished one on one. I guarantee you, you go down to two on two or one on one, there's not an NHL game that's not going to finish within a couple of minutes. At and least. how exciting was it? It's wild. Even and it's for the little kids, it's exciting. incredible. It's Look, incredible. I believe that there are people right now who wholeheartedly, when you get down to two or three minutes left in a tie game, really, really want overtime because they want to see that three on three. It's great. Steve Milton, your next rule that you would change given c control of all the sports world? Well, I have to flip, flip a coin on this one in soccer because I've been against uh, 
two things here, the offside rule, which creates oh, one little small piece of strategy, which is the uh, offside trap. You know, you got to be a soccer guru to understand this, the offside tra uh, trap. And the fact there's only one referee for about 17 square miles of space. Both of these problems the NHL had for a long time and stubbornly refused to deal with them. Look what happened when they put a second referee in. Tough for about half a year till, till, uh, to, because there were so many penalties. But then the game opened up because you, you, were, you weren't allowed to do some stuff behind the play, hold back that good back checker, all those kinds of things. And they took out the center red line for the pass and all of the things that they said, oh, people will stand at the other end and, and play law ball. Well, if they play law ball, that means it's four and four in the other end, in the offensive end. So uh, the NHL finally, after 100 plus years of, of having both the same things, made both those rules really against the, the, the wishes of the traditionalists and came up with a better game. If you're trying to uh, sell this game still in the North American market, you've got to, I think, get rid of, in some form, at least modify that offside rule and perhaps add a second referee. Then you get less flopping, all of that kind of stuff. Rick? Yeah, I'm down for the less flopping. There's no doubt about it. That is a stain on soccer, uh, whether f f whatever nationality you are. I know Italians and Argentinians, they get, you know, the, the finger pointed at them, but it's really everyone because they know they can get away with it, whether it's a free kick or a penalty shot, to, you know, within the 18-yard blocks. Uh, I used to be a, a soccer referee, and uh, while I didn't find it quite challenging in terms of getting to one end to the other because there's a way of doing that, but B, it's, yeah, it's, you can't see everything. One person can't see everything, especially anything behind you, so that second referee or that second official would be, uh, you know, mindful of that. There is an off-field official as well in soccer, and we have the two linesmen, but yeah, adding a second referee, I think, would mitigate the floppingness. What they have to do, basically, to get rid of the diving is to card these guys and mm. give them red cards, and that would stop it instantly, no doubt about it. There'd be no argument you're off, you're down to 10 men, that would stop in an instant. I feel like you're always always kind of thing. I, I, I've argued for a long time I that what soccer should do, one of the things soccer should do is have a second official, but not on the field, because again, the field is huge and bodies block your view. If you have a second official in the booth, you can watch on TV, because you can then tell who's flopping. They do, they do have an eye in the sky, but it's very limited in what they use it for. Well, but I'm saying if you have a live eye in the sky and so you see a guy flop, he can signal down, and it's an immediate, as Rick says, an immediate red card for a flop. You're right. It'll, it'll take one or two instances of that where the guy is off for a dive, and that, you would think, is going to go away. And the only way in soccer, unfortunately, because, as Steve, you point out, the acreage of the game, the only way is with someone upstairs. The other, the other, you know, back to Steve's, you know, offside portion of it is if you wanted to eliminate the uh, regularity of the offside trap in soccer uh, is allow one player to be offside, but you can allow two. And now, so now you're forcing the defense to go back a little bit, changing their strategies. That's one way to do it. Opens it up. Opens a hole somewhere else. All right. Who's up next? Who did I, who am I up to? That would be me. The rule? Rick? Yeah, that's me. Rick, so the, your next rule? the, the NFL catch rule has to be simplified because what is a catch? What isn't a catch? Uh, you know, that translates into what's a fumble? What's not a fumble? Is he in bounds? Is he out of bounds? If an offensive player fumbles and it goes out of the end zone, the defense gets the ball. It's so confusing. It should be you catch the ball. You have two feet in. If you hit the ground and the ball comes loose, I'm sorry, it's a fumble retain possession. If you catch the ball and someone hits you and you lose the ball, but your elbow is down or your butt cheek is down, it is so confusing at times for the fans. Yes, it makes some great drama when they go to instant replay and they have frame by frame and was the ball loose or did he have possession? Uh, you know, how tall was the grass blade that hit his, you know, left calf? It is unbelievably uh, intoxicatingly difficult to follow. Uh, and as a regular fan, I think they just want to have it cut and dry and move on with the football game. Bubba, could you not just put a clock on this? Could you not say you must possess the ball for one second? And if you've held the ball completely for one full second, it's a catch, and then it would be a fumble or not a catch. Wouldn't it be a simpler way to put a clock on it? 
I think you're putting, you're going, you're walking down a dangerous, dangerous alley with that type of uh, the definition of the catch rule, which in itself, because I, I don't, now you're adding another element to, to putting a clock to actually, well, then when did he bring it in? When did he have two hands on it? What was possession? This is a clouded rule as it stands right now. So to add one more element to it, I think would just confuse people more. I'm wondering if the NFL, National Football League, went more so to the college game, the U.S. college game, or more like the CFL, where it was only one foot in, or one foot in terms of a reception, that if it would, it would clarify things a little bit more. I know they're so technical in having it, that with two, hand, with two feet on the ground, two hands down on the ground, two hands on the, on the ball, that if it, it just, it's just, it's become so convoluted right now. And I know they're trying really hard to, to make it, you know, uh, to make it clear, because you've actually had playoff games. Uh, I think of a game at Lambeau Field with uh, the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers with Des Bryant catching a pass. That we're, we're, you know, it went crazy. We just didn't know, because I think there was many times, I, hey, I feel like I know the game. I think all four of us think that we know that football game really, really, really well. And I think with the rules in the National Football League, I've become confused, and I don't even say if it's a catch anymore. I just wait for the replay. And I think ultimately to wait for the replay is, is a wrong, wrong attitude for many of us. Steve? I'd put a, I'd put a timing on the replay. That's where I'd put the timing. Yeah. 15 well, you seconds. Can't tell, if it's away. If original it's not clearly obvious. Original call stands. What? If it's not clearly obvious in the first 20 and seconds. put a time limit on it. Put a time. I don't care. This, oh, we just get it right. Let's get it right. Well, that's a lot more important in the United States. I'll keep going back to betting, and that's why. You know, it, it, you, it, millions of dollars can change hands on a call like that. But but put a limit on it, then everybody will know. But I've never understood why they don't have a limit on it anyway, because the idea of instant yeah. replay was not necessarily at the first to get it perfect. It was to us to avoid egregious mistakes. Remember the NHL offside one with a, who was it in Colorado who was like nine feet offside? And the idea was if a guy is so far offside and somehow our linesman missed it. We'll watch a replay and right away we'll go, oh, yeah, of course, we missed that guy. And then it immediately turned into this thing where we have to have electron microscopes to see if the guy's foot is on or offside. To me, if you put a 20-second rule, you catch the completely egregious mistakes and the other stuff, you know what, so be it. The game is – the players aren't perfect. Why should the officials be perfect? 15 seconds. 15, 20 seconds, and you can but solve if you guys, but if but if you put this time, this timing clock on a reception, there are – I mean, look at this. They have different angles. They have like 15, 16 different angles they can look at a catch. And each one of them can tell you a different story in terms of possession, which I think gets into a dangerous point of zone where you say, okay, let's put the clock on that camera angle, which to me at times when you look at a different camera angle, you're not quite sure if he had possession at that time. But does that not I, make the case? If you've got three different camera angles and you get two different stories, then there's always going to be a lack of, of surety about whether or not it was a catch. This is supposed to stop the egregious refereeing mistakes. And if you've watched two angles and you can't tell, then you go with the call on the field. You don't start. Well, agreed, you don't start. If you, made it a, if you made it a one-minute uh, replay, you, you can sell it. You know, this one-minute replay – Brought you by, blah, blah, blah. And you can have it in football and hockey and whatever the case is. That's the way to do it. That's the last thing we need is more commercials. <laughs> You're going to get it anyways. <laughs> Stop it. Yep. This, one, this replay brought to you by Minute Maid. Uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. We're done. Very quick. Who is up next? Bubba, are you next? What is I your know. Play? You did yours already? I think it's you, Scott. It's me. All right. I, we've had yeah. so many rules that I've completely lost track here. All right. My last one would be. And this goes back to a game that I watched on replay while we've been off in self-quarantining, and it's baseball. And it's umpires who have the right to give a warning to a team after a batter has been plunked. No warning should ever be allowed to be issued until both teams have plunked a guy. Because baseball does such a poor job with suspensions and discipline of pitchers who get four games or five games, which really works out to one game. If a team gets drilled, Baseball should allow the other team to drill a guy, and then the warning comes in. If you put the warning before the second team can do this, you just create chaos, and we've seen that at times. We've seen it now where the umpire has created more problems than he's solved with those warnings. What we haven't seen 
is what would happen if you put your, put your put no what we haven't seen is what happened if we put your rule in which is who knows you know but, like, but that's often what, but steve that's often the way the umpires have done it they've said okay you get to have you hit them okay we're gonna let you drill the guy as long as it's it down is. or in the hip mm-hmm. or whatever and then fine we're now it's a warning but if you formalize it then what you're going to have is like open war- warfare and it, that sounds okay until it's not okay uh i, I agree with your pro point in principle I, I think somehow you got to just warn the team that did it first, but I don't know how you do that. Like All you right, can't do me, it again. Well, we have Steve. Let so that, that'd be a little better rule. twist on that. Let me change my rule re- for realignment. Then any pitcher that hits a batter must bat in the bottom or the <laughs> next, the top of the next <laughs> inning. He must go up to bat yeah. next inning. How about yeah. that one? That's my. I've changed my my rule change. My new rule change is any pitcher that drills a batter must bat in the next inning. And well, one of the things that shutting the baseball season down is doing is preventing us seeing exactly what's going to happen because what would have happened with the Houston Astros so many times this year? Like, we would have seen all of those scenarios. Oh, it's still coming, I think. I think Houston's yeah. going to get yeah, their well, come-up. Yeah. yeah, because players police themselves to a point, obviously, and then the umps get involved when it gets out of hand. But, yeah, that, that is still coming for sure. Is it still coming for the Boston Red Sox? Because, the, I mean, are the players going to take things into their own hands because the Red Sox – I mean, other than the video replay guy who got punished to, for a couple of years, they walked away scot-free. So do baseball players take things into their own hands and punish the Red Sox for 2018? Alex Cora is with Houston and is there during the cheating situation, gets penalized, comes to Boston. Remarkably, by an amazing coincidence, Boston starts using the same technology, but Major League Baseball determines Cora had no knowledge of this whatsoever. It was just a video guy that started this by himself the next year. Come on. Uh, But you know what? That's a good topic that we will do in another episode of Home Games coming up. Thanks for watching. Subscribe down below. You can see the subscribe button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the little bell, too, so you get a notification every time one of these comes up. We love doing them, want to keep doing them. We will be back again really soon. Enjoy.